A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord, and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, to give them oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit, Verum Domini. Forever will I sing the goodness of the Lord. The favors of the Lord I will sing forever. Through all generations, my mouth shall proclaim your faithfulness. For you have said, My kindness is established forever. In heaven you have confirmed your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. Forever will I confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him, that my hand may be always with him, and that my arm may make him strong. My faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and through my name shall his horn be exalted. He shall say to me, You are my brother, my God, the rock, my Savior. The Lord be with you. And also A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. A stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you clothed me. Ill and you cared for me in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise the Lord During this last month of the liturgical year, the church always turns our attention toward the end, toward the afterlife, 
to what we traditionally call the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. It must start off, of course, with All Saints Day, and the church brings to our attention immediately the communion of saints in heaven, those who have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white, those who have fought the good fight, those who have run the good race to the finish and won the prize of the imperishable crown that will not be denied them, that they will be permanent, they will be in there forever with God in heaven. The next day on November 2nd, of course, we celebrated All Souls Day, and we remembered and prayed for our deceased loved ones and all the poor souls in purgatory who are being purified as they are preparing to enter the beatific vision of God in heaven. Toward the end of the month, on the last Sunday of the liturgical year, we will celebrate, of course, Christ the King. And we're reminded of Christ's reign in heaven and how that will come about definitively, absolutely, irrevocably uh, at the end of time, and everyone will be, so to speak, under his reign, whether united to him or not. There's no question about whether he will reign or not. The only question is who will reign with him. And that's one reason why we need the saints. They help to fix our eyes on the prize that they have won. You know, we all need heroes. We need people to emulate. And today we celebrate one of the greatest saints in the church's history, St. Martin of Tours. This is, of course, him I'd like to speak. He was born in Panania, which is in modern-day Hungary, in around the year 316, maybe 317. He was born of uh, parents who were honorable in rank. His dad was a military officer, but they were also pagans. They moved shortly after his birth to northern Italy into Milan. And Christianity at that time, if you remember the, the Edict of Toleration issued by Constantine, legalized Christianity in 313. So it's starting to spread especially fast and wide. And so he came in contact with that, and we don't know exactly what happened in that realm, but he went to seek a priest, and he, he asked to be admitted as a catechumen. And at the time, he was only 10 years old. I mean, he did, like I said, his family had no faith background, no, no Christian background, of course, but he had this desire. Something came into his heart. He may be in contact with someone or heard a sermon or something, but something moved him. And even with this, he also had a desire for solitude. You know, he had heard about St. Procomius and St. Anthony in the desert. He prayed long and hard himself, and he desired to give everything to God, his whole being, his whole life. He longed to be a monk. He longed to live kind of a life of where he was face to face with God, just meditating in, in union with God. Other arrangements were made for him. At the age of 15, he had to enter the military. There was a, a law at the time in the Roman Empire that if your father was a military officer, you had to follow in those footsteps. His father, of course, wanted him to do that, but it wasn't a choice he had, but he was enrolled in the military. He rebelled against that. They arrested him and chained him. And as he was in chains being, you know, pro progressing toward this military service, he meditated on the military service, and he realized that the obedience that he would be, would be required of him to enter the military and serve there was the same kind of obedience he would be asked to give to God as a monk. And so he, in the end, willingly submitted to that and entered the corps. But for him, it was a great trial. But he served in the cavalry and the, in the Imperial Guard as an officer. It's a sketchy during those years exactly what all he did, but it was a, a time of peace. You know, of course, Constantine had conquered his enemies. There was peace on the borders. So he, he didn't end up fighting in any wars at that time or any battles. In his position, he frequently inspected different posts in the town and country. And in the year, the winter of 338, 339, when he was traveling around, it was very severe weather and many people froze to death. Uh, and during that time, of course, we have the famous scene where he came upon a naked beggar. His teeth were chattering. Uh, Martin drew his sword and cut his cloak in half that he wore, you know, in these cold nights and gave half to the beggar. And that night, of course, in the, he had a dream, a vision of Christ wearing that same half of the, that other half of the cloak that he had given him. And angels were with him, and the voice of the angels whispered in Martin's ear, look, Martin, look at the Lord. Don't you notice anything? And the Lord said to his angelic companions, Martin, still a catechumen, covered me with his cloak. And of course, that's why we have today's reading chosen by the church for this feast day. I was naked and you clothed me. And of course, the righteous say, when do we do that? He said, when you did it to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. And so Christ is saying, you clothed me when you clothed this naked man, of course. And, but Martin took it also as a little bit of a chide. He said, Martin, while still a catechumen, he had been a catechumen, I think five or six years at the time. And so he said, 
he, he, it's just hit him. What is he waiting for? It's just, it was a compliment, but also a little bit of a reproach. So Martin flew to baptism, and at 339, the Easter vigil that year, he was baptized at the age of 22. As I said, this cloak story is very popular. I was eating with a couple last week in Kansas City, which is an hour south of our monastery, St. Benedict's in Atchison. And I mentioned this feast day coming up, and they mentioned immediately in the Kansas City Plaza, there's a huge statue, they said about 15 feet high, of St. Martin cutting his cloak for the beggar in a public place. It's actually dedicated to a philanthropist. And I looked online, it's a beautiful statue, and I can't wait to go see it. Like I said, it's a, it's a very popular story, the most popular story, of course, of St. Martin's life, oftentimes depicted in paintings and stained glass windows. But as this happened, he's still in the military. And the moment of truth came where a military contest, contest was looming. And the practice of the day was that they would get uh, the people who were serving the military before battle, they would call them in and give them some extra money to kind of inspire heroism. So they would go into the battle, they would fight hard. So Martin came forward, but he refused the money. He declared respectfully that he would take no part in the battle. The emperor flew into a rage and called him a coward and said he would go into battle even with a sword at his back if necessary. And Martin said it wouldn't be necessary. He would advance at the head of his legion unarmed. You know, in the name of the Lord Jesus, he said, without shield or helmet or any protection but the sign of the cross, I shall be the first into the enemy line and that without shadow of fear. The emperor said, I take you at your word and you shall not get out of it. So they locked him in prison that night in their, in their cell so that he could not escape. And the next day they were planning to put him out front with no battle armament just to be you know, slaughtered. Well, the next morning, totally out of the blue, against all probability, the enemy came to offer, to, to want uh, peace, unconditional means. In other words, they, had to, they could decide the terms. The emperor said this, it was a miracle. I mean, it was just so out of, the, out of the ordinary and out of what was expected. And he attributed to Martin and he allowed him to go free and to, to end his military service, which he did immediately. And as Father Anthony said, this is Veterans Day, and we need to remember there is such thing as just war. And St. Martin is the patron saint of the military, so it was not against that in per, se, per se, but Martin just felt himself not called to bear arms and fight. You know, and so he didn't. He was released, it was, he was 25 years old at the time. He went to Port Huers in France, and he lived a life of a hermit, like the fathers of the desert. He was under the saintly Bishop Hillary, who recognized God's manifold gifts in Martin and encouraged him toward theological studies, so Martin did that. Uh, during this time, he had a desire to go talk to his parents about his faith, and he did that. And when he went back, his uh, mother did convert, and his father obstinately refused and opposed it. And that, that is really a wound that he kind of uh, took particularly hard, and it really accompanied him, accompanied him the rest of his life. But due to Martin's holiness and wisdom, of course, many people followed him into his hermitage where he was living alone with God, and it ended up becoming a monastery, a community of the faithful. It was probably it was the same route that St. Benedict took 150 years later, which could explain the great devotion St. Benedict had for St. Martin. Uh, St. Benedict named his first chapel after St. Martin, and also served at Benedictine College, and our chapel on campus is named after St. Martin, as is our campus ministry center. But at one point, Martin had to be away from his community, and when he came back, he found out that his, his, the first brother that followed him had died. He wept like Christ did at the death of Lazarus at his tomb. And then, like Elijah, he laid his body down on the dead body of his confrere and prayed for hours. And he felt the Holy Spirit moved. He got up, and this brother was alive. Uh, it was as you're gonna see through his story, they said that apostolic grace flowed through Martin. I mean, he did the things that the apostles did. It was really, a, he was just a miracle worker. And that was the first of the people that we have uh, attributed to him that was raised from the dead. Later, he was visiting a house where a slave had hung himself and he took that body to himself and, and clung to it and prayed. And that person came back to life. Both those were relatively private instances. You know, a few people knew about it, a few people were there. But later, as a bishop, he had his, the other one we have attributed to him, the other that's attested by history to him of raising someone from the dead. He went to a, a, a large pagan town, and people heard about him, like he was a bishop at the time, and a lady came out and told him, said, 
uh, that her, she was carrying her dead baby. She said, this is my only son who is dead. She gave him to them, you are God's friend, we know. Give me back my son. He is my only son. And St. Martin took the child, the baby, knelt down and prayed, and then stood up and gave the woman back her child alive. And that was with multitudes of people uh, that were there witnessing this, and the whole town demanded to be made Christian after this miracle. There's so many miracles, I can't recount them all. As Father Anthony said, I'd be preaching at least 30 minutes if I did. But his popularity grew. Uh, the Bishop of Tours died, and the people wanted him to be bishop. But he felt unworthy to be the bishop. He was so humble. And actually, when Portiers, when Bishop Hillary died, he also was asked to be bishop there, and he refused that. He refused again. But the people sent messengers to him that there was a lady who was sick, and they needed his, the, this, his healing power. So as he went to visit this lady, they closed him in, basically imprisoning him, and took him to the cathedral to have him ordain the bishop. Uh, in the end, he acquiesced to it just because he, he discerned it was the will of God, though it wasn't his will. And so almost against his will, he was ordained a bishop. But as a bishop, of course, he worked long and hard to spread the faith. He loved our Lord with all his heart. He wanted to bring that faith to his flock. Uh, in such a mission, he, had ex he ex experienced much resistance. Like I said, Christianity was legal at the time. And in the cities, it had taken root, but in the, in the rural areas outside the city, it still was dominated by paganism. And so one thing he did was he would want to visit these areas to bring Christ to the people who did not know him. Uh, actually, at one time, the devil even appeared to him. And he said, where are you going? He said, wherever the Lord calls me. Very well, said the devil. Wherever you go, whatever you undertake, you will find me right with you. Martin said, the Lord is with me. I do not fear what man can do to me. And the enemy vanished, Satan kept his word, and so did Martin. But uh, in the towns, like I said, he would go to outside the towns to the, the villages and the people in the spread out areas. He would preach the gospel, he would destroy pagan temples, he would destroy these totem, the poles, the sacred poles, he would destroy the, the sacred trees. He would do anything he could as he was preaching to them to destroy the pagan uh, idols and replace them with, with Christ, with churches and with uh, devotion to Christ. Miracles would accompany his missions also. Uh, one pagan, when he was visiting one place, he kissed a pagan and the, he picked, kissed a leper who was a pagan. The person was healed instantaneously and people converted, of course. Uh, one of his greatest miracles that was on par with the cutting of the cloak, you know, that story, especially in his day, but kind of lost some of its uh, popularity or knowledge of that through history, is when he was visiting one pagan town in particular, the village, and the people were, the pagans were really strenuously opposing him. And finally, he got to the point where one of the chief pagans came to him and said, uh, when he wanted to cut down this sacred tree, he said, we'll cut down the tree, I'll cut it down, only if you're under it. He said, no problem. So they put guidelines on the tree. They started cutting down the tree. Martin is kneeling right and praying right in the line where the tree has to fall. And as the tree starts to bend, the people who are with him and are, are already converted are just panicking and uh, you know, just in terror and fear. And as the tree starts to lean toward him, he looks up, he makes a sign of the cross, and the tree falls the other way. And of course, again, they just lined up to, to be baptized. You know, awestruck, this crowd acclaimed Christ as their king. They were baptized. Uh, like I said, many other stories. One other one just particular in my mind was where he also went to, you know, destroy pagan idols. And one man who was particularly incensed you know, came screaming and had an ax and he was gonna, you know, take a shot at Martin and Martin just pulled down his collar of his neck and just gave his neck to him. And as the man pulled the ax back, his body flew over the other, other, other end of the ax, head over hills, and he was the first in line to be baptized. But all these wonderful things happen. When he would establish a community there and would convert all these pagans, he would leave a priest there to tend to the needs of the people, the pastoral needs. That's the beginning of our parochial system. It began with St. Martin and his care for these people who were outside the, the cities. Uh, when he was near dying, his brothers begged him, uh, have pity on us and do not leave us. Martin wept. He said, Lord, if I am still necessary to my people, I do not refuse the labor. As to the flock for whom I fear, you know how to guard it. He was laying there for, for a couple days on his back, facing up, and someone came in and wanted to turn him over to give him relief. And he said, no, please let me face, you know, let my soul, you know, direct my soul toward its destination, which is, which is of course, heaven. If he wanted to look toward where he was headed. 
the devil actually, of course, never giving up, laughed, and Martin cried, what are you doing here, you bloodthirsty beast? You will find nothing in me that is yours, accursed angel. It is Abraham's bosom that is to receive me. And saying these words, he died. Uh, miracles abounded during his life. Just another one, a powerful senator uh, who was wealthy and very intellectual, was losing his sight, and as it got worse and worse and very much progressed in that direction, uh, Martin knew him and visited him and wiped his eyes with a sponge to ease some of the pain, and he could see perfectly after that. And the man, uh, fought, he was already a Christian, but just not really strong in it. He sold everything uh, and became a religious, and we know him today as St. Paulinus of Nova. St. Martin had such a great effect on so many people. And the miracles didn't cease after his death. Uh, Gregory of Tours had four volumes, four books that he wrote of his miracles, and he left out hundreds. But therein lies the beauty of the saints. As St. Martin wanted his dying body to face upward to direct his soul toward its goal, toward its destination of heaven, that's what the saints do for us. By their example and by their intercession, they point our souls in the right direction as we prepare one day to leave this world on our way to heaven. St. Martin, pray for us.